Uh, good afternoon, respected viewers. It's George from Ireland. Well, I was asked by um, one of my loyal viewers to uh, make a video about Napoleon. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, Napoleon, who was he? He's best, have, best known for having been Emperor of the French and a victorious military commander, though he eventually met his Waterloo. Um, and there's some people, he's a model of a, of a military, military dictator. He's was a reformer in some ways. Uh, didn't leave that much of a lasting legacy. That's, I suppose that's the fascinating thing. He rose and fell very quickly. Um, an opportunist and I think someone who's very unprincipled. Um, he did have a few uh, positive uh, effects on history. But anyway, he's born in 1769 in, um, uh, in Corsica, an island that belongs to France. Had he been born a year earlier, it, were, it would have it belonged to, uh, to Genoa, the Republic of Genoa, remembering at the time that Italy was not united, was two do dozen separate states or countries, if you will, different republics, the papal states in central Italy ruled by the Pope, noted states plural, because uh, the papal states um, had the Pope send a cardinal delegate to each one, a legate rather, to, to rule each one. And um, some of the northern Italian states, part of the Holy Roman Empire, it was immensely complex. So Genoa sold uh, Corsica, this um, uh, rebellious island, to France. The people were indomitable, some of the Corsican nationalists would say. So uh, the people of Corsica spoke Corsu, a dialect of Italian, but it, it's quite different from standard Italian. And at that time, it was very different. I, I knew someone from Ventimiglia, um, this uh, town in the extreme um, north uh, east of Italy, right on the border with France on the coast. And her boyfriend was from Corsica, and they, they he, his Corsu was unintelligible to her. So they, they communicated in French. Um, anyhow, but uh, Napoleon was said to be born with a full set of teeth. Is that even possible? And people thought, well, this is, this is a, um, a portent of greatness. Um, so his father, Carlo, was, was a lawyer. His mother, Letizia, was a mother of a dozen children and the grandmother to over a hundred children. And she'd got married at, at 14, which was quite common at the time, started having children straight away. So Corsica is quite a fairly mountainous island. People were shepherds there and so on. And often they didn't like being part of France. There was a lot of fighting. So Napoleon was born in Ajaccio, the major um, uh, city of, of Corsica. So it's got more in common with Italy than it does in France at the time. But uh, his, his family had chosen to cooperate uh, with the French. But most Corsicans perceiving the French as being foreign. So um, uh, Napoleon, he was, oh my goodness, the second son, if I got that right. So lots of sisters and brothers. Um, and grew up speaking Corsu, like I said. Only started to learn French at the age of 10. And he never mastered French grammar, despite being Emperor of France. So he went to a school at Brienne um, in mainland France. It's quite distant, to, distant from Paris to the, to the east. They're run by many monks. He's built up a Christian, of course, of the Catholic denomination. Um, so 95% of French people were Catholics at the time. A few Protestants, a very few Jews. He hated school. Well, mm, I didn't like that school very much. He was bullied a bit, but partly because of his accent known as paille au nez, as in straw in the nose. Uh, but uh, he excelled at mathematics and at history. He was quite, quite an able pupil, famously organized a, a, a snowball fight and attack on the older boy's um, snow fortress. So he showed early prowess and then went off to train as a military officer his other brother Joseph was there with him um, and because he was mathematically gifted he was going to go into artillery because of course he had to be able to traject the sorry calculate the trajectory of shells and things like that and how heavy were these things a, a lot of maths in it um, anyway I suppose he was born at the right time because when he was 20 years old it was the French Revolution and then he he went along with it he so he threw a lot in his lot with that well no one was really resisting it where he was so he's an artillery officer posted the south of France his elder brother, Joseph, was quite involved in, uh, in politics. So um, I don't want to tell the whole history of the French Revolution. He disliked priests like Stalin. Uh, indeed, but then he was canny enough to sometimes team up with them when it, when it worked for him. I suppose they didn't like alternative authorities, not a particularly religious person. He later thought of inventing his own religion, writing his own Quran, as he said. Um, and he was uh, delightfully free, free of religious prejudice, not anti-Semitic wanted to appeal to the Israelites, as he said it, or the, to the Jewish people of Europe. And indeed, he emancipated them um, when he conquered Germany. I suppose it perhaps led some Germans say, oh, well, the Jews must have been collaborating with the French, so well, let's hammer them. There's a lot of anti-Jewish prejudice there anyway. 
Bonaparte, he obviously spelled his name with a U in the early days, as in the Italian sign, buona parte, as in good part, but he dropped the U, more French spelling. But uh, some German Jews took the surname Schoenteil, which just means good part, just like Bonaparte. Um, and actually his, uh, how did that work out? What work out, sorry. Um, and his name was actually originally Napoleone, should be an E on the end, but um, a nickname Rabulione, as in disruptor. Um, so then, yeah, the French Revolution is an awful lot of fighting. There were some French royalists attempted a counter-revolution. 17, uh, 1792, France declared war on many of her neighbors, trying to rid the world of kings and um, declared war on the United Kingdom. So some of the British landed in the south. The Jews didn't want assimilated to be assimilated. Well, I think a lot of them wanted out of the ghetto. In the 19th century, it was, it was a process whereby they were allowed into mainstream society to compete in the trades and professions and go to ordinary schools and universities. So some of them seized these opportunities with alacrity, the liberal and reform-minded Jews, and uh, um, achieved great affluence, great professional success. Um, but obviously that engendered jealousy and made some people even more viciously anti-Semitic. So um, although he was good towards Jewish people, he was terrible towards black people, very uh, bigoted against uh, people of African stock. But um, I'll come on to that. Um, so identified with the Jacobin faction and um, then counter-revolutionaries landed in, in southern France with the British army support. Um, and the French revolutionaries, they were squabbling with each other, an anti-Gentile, I mean anti-Gentile? I don't know, it wasn't anti-Gentile. Um, um, so the um, Jacobins were against the um, Girondins, also known as the Montagnards, and the various other revolutionary factions, factions squabbling accuse each other of being traitors and so on. So he's arrested and briefly imprisoned because of his political connections, but he managed to talk his way out of it. Um, his brother was the more, more politically involved one. The Jacques Bar was seen as a more extreme revolutionary faction amongst the first to talk about abolishing the monarchy. Because remember, in 1789, at first it was a reform process, but then it got out of hand, and they, nobody was talking about abolishing the monarchy in the beginning. It took him about three years to abolish the monarchy. Um, so uh, obviously he was kind of to swing right the other way in time. Two sides, anti-Semitic and anti-Gentile. Well, I think very few Jewish people are anti-Gentile. A, a bit difficult to be against more than 99% of the world. Is this some sort of ludicrous anti-Semitic conspiracy theory? If so, would you please keep your anti-Jewish filth uh, off my channel? Um, anyway, so uh, there was the Battle of Toulon where they, they the Royalists and the British had landed and Napoleon's men were besieging them, but he knew how to fire the shells high to hit what he needed to hit. You know, they can't go more or less like this. They have to go up and hit the right place in the harbor, even heating up, not shells, I should say cannonball, because they really were balls, just stone balls. Or sometimes there was grape shot, things like that, because they didn't have shells which exploded on, on impact. And in time, um, he'd had to, he had to disperse some Royalists who were attempting to, to make a comeback with this whiff of grape shot. Famously, he did so. Um, okay, so then he was um, invading Italy on behalf of revolutionary France to overthrow the reactionary regimes there as they'd see it, to defeat Austria as in the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, the Holy Roman Empire was much of Central Europe. Um, really, its empire was, it, the capital of the empire was Vienna. The Habsburg family, as in the Austrian imperial family, they had the title Holy Roman Empire for generations, for centuries. It was actually elective but only elected by a handful of men, like the king of here and the grand duke of there and the archbishop of wherever. So the Habsburgs had it, although it wasn't, strictly speaking, hereditary. Anyway, so um, he overthrew some reaction regimes in northern Italy and set, set up the Cisalpine Republic. So some local grandees threw in their lot with the French, partly out of ideological conviction, mostly out of op opportunism, I would suspect. And Napoleon plundered the place for um, art treasures and had them uh, carted back to Paris covered himself in glory. I know lots of people do this sort of thing. Um, so famously, at one battle, he insisted on personally aiming the um, cannon, and that was the job of a corporal, and people called him the little corporal. He was never a corporal, but he just nicknamed that. Um, so showed much bravery at the Battle of Lodi, where he dashed forward, and he had to be, he was at a tackle to the ground by one of his men, saying, sir, you'll get yourself killed. Typical liberal. Uh, were you saying I am or he is? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classical liberal. I don't think he really had a political ideology. It was just he was just an egotist. 
So they're fighting for this bridge at Lodi, and having been to Lodi, I see what they're talking about, because the, the river there is wide and fast flowing, even in summer. So if you don't have a bridge, it's gonna be very difficult to get across. Okay, you can go across in boats, but they're gonna be go woo, way downstream, it's very difficult to land as a group. Um, anyway, and there's a plaque up in the street there where he famously almost got killed. Uh, it's fighting against the Austro Austrians there. When I say Austrians, they're people of other nationalities of the Holy Roman Empire. We'd now regard them some as Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Croats, perhaps Bosnians, Romanians, Hungarians, some Italians. There wasn't much of an Italian national identity at the time, identifying with your, with your state of Italy, and maybe not even re regarding yourself as Italian or think, thinking of yourself as belonging to Italy. Where was Italy? It was very debatable. Um, Italy had fallen apart centuries before with the end of the Roman Empire. So um, they clashed with the Catholic Church. Remember the, the, the um, French Revolution set up its own uh, religion, the cult of the supreme being. Prussians, yes, R R France was against Pr war against Prussia for a long time. And uh, they fell out with the Pope and they briefly captured Pope Pius um, and try him to bend him to their will. Pius the, oh my goodness, seventh, if I remember rightly. Um, so um, I won't go through all the political machinations in France, but uh, they kept the name, changed the name of their legislature, go through new constitutions, had new elective bodies, like one, one group could, could uh, debate legislation but not vote in it, another could propose legislation but not vote in it, another could vote in it but not discuss it. Separation of powers, in some ways good, but perhaps there was too much separation, it was a bit of a political traffic jam. Anyway, 1798, well, their war against the United Kingdom was the best way to defeat the UK. He said, well, really, it's India. We're almost completely driven out of India in, in, in the 1760s. Must get it back. And India is the key to the world. That's the source of um, the United Kingdom's wealth and greatness. So take it. So let's go to, uh, the, uh, let's attack Egypt, part of the Ottoman Empire, and from there make our way to India, which is very fanciful. You'd have to get across, get across so much desert, so many mountains to get to India. That was a crazy idea. You really wanted to go. I suppose you would have sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. There was no Suez Canal in Egypt at the time. But anyway, he landed in Egypt. The British were aware of this. And then um, Admiral Lord Nelson was scouring the Mediterranean, trying to stop the French fleet carrying him. And on the short May night, by just one um, hour, Napoleon, um, he managed to evade um, the Royal Navy. Go see Aleander. Okay, I don't know what that is. So sorry, I got all these things itching me, all these uh, mosquitoes. Anyway, so they landed at Egypt and um, conquered Egypt in, in, in short order. The Mamelukku ruling Egypt. So the Ottomans in, in, in Istanbul didn't have much effective control. Alexander the Great, well, trying to emulate him indeed. And like indeed, when, when you cross over into, into Italy via the, the um, St. Bernard's Pass, um, you can see that famous um, uh, oil painting. Who's it by? Is it by Gros? Or I can't remember. Or Jacques-Louis David. And uh, it's got... Um, various names like Hannibal, Julius Caesar, other conquerors who'd been this way. And um, from the monks at St. Bernard's Pass, those were the famous St. Bernard dogs, uh, getting so much in terms of provisions that he leaving them an IOU, which would be worth hundreds of millions of, of euros these days, especially taking into account compound interest. So, um, and remember, uh, Italy was more or less home for him. So uh, perhaps not seeing himself as, as an invader. But anyway, back to when he was in Egypt, the Mamluk um, were, were, were ruling were ruling Egypt, and then he fought the so-called Battle of the Pyramids. It was actually wasn't in sight of the Battle of the Pyramids, and he claims that he'd addressed his soldiers. Soldiers, 40 centuries look down upon you. Um, the thing is, he wasn't a fantastic public speaker, because remember, um, his, his spoken French was um, flawed. So he did have a speech which he, off the cuff, which he'd given many, many times. Soldat, je suis content de vous. And he made it his business to know the names of them, and if the general addressed you as a private by your name and, and seemed to know something about your family, soldiers really responded well to this, his, his supposed concern for them. Actually, he was pretty terrible, and he cut the commissariat and the medical department and just left wounded men to die. So I don't think it's very good to his men, probably propagandizing. Um, he used to lie like mad. There was this French expression to lie like a bulletin. A bulletin was an official announcement, like the official newspaper. And he very much believed in the censorship of the press. He had absolutely no time for civil liberty, fair trials, anything like that. Um, and he often rewrite official accounts of battles to glorify his, his role a bit more. Um, but I talk about more of him as a student military tactics. So he took Cairo and that was that. But then things started to go wrong in Egypt. How much of the Nile Valley were we going to conquer? Micromanager. 
that someone's just posted and fighting a sort of a counterinsurgency campaign in the south and some of men are dying, dying of tropical diseases um, and they couldn't go too far into the desert and then the Ottomans were massing troops in the Holy Land, you know, Palestine or Israel would now call it. So he decided to take the initiative attack there first, some success, meeting a tiny Jewish community in Palestine. Um, and um, famously at Acre, he ordered um, over a thousand um, Ottoman prisoners to be, to be killed. So we now regard that as a war crime. Some of his men were dying of plague. He visited the hospital, one of the few morally brave things he did. It wasn't just exposing himself to enemy fire, but he was persuaded to leave. Oh my God, he might get killed. Have you been experiencing flash flooding in your local area? No, I haven't. Where do you think my local area is? Um, anyway, so the Egy Egyptian campaign was going badly for him. The Ottomans were closing in. So many of his men have died of illness. Uh, the, the, even Cairo was restive. So he decided to leave his men in the lurch. There had been also the, the, the Battle of the Nile, where um, Horatio Nelson had sunk so much of the French fleet at Abu Kir Bay on the northern coast of Egypt. So the French were going to find it impossible to evacuate or to get in more supplies or even really to communicate, to get orders from France, to send news, to ask for reinforcements, to get more uh, ammunition or anything. So Napoleon said, well, I, I'm getting out of here. I never want to be associated with the soldiers. Uh, it was a really shameful thing of the commanders just simply abandoned his men, took ship and sailed back to France. Many died on ships with little food and had, had made many enemies. So that was that. So they eventually surrendered. Um, and the British had a printing press and printed French newspapers, lying French newspapers, saying how France was being defeated elsewhere, given to the French in Egypt to persuade them to capitulate. And some of the um, uh, Egyptian, um, whatever, say, uh, uh, concubines or prostitutes who'd consorted with the French were then executed afterwards. Kubrick was a fan. Anyway, so 1799, Napoleon returned, returned to France. Uh, what was going on there? His brother was still prominent. Um, and. Um, and they decided to seize power. France was run by a director at the time. It's in three men, this triumvirate. So he, he'd become part of it, along with um, uh, Charles, uh, what was his name, sorry, Emmanuel Joseph Sies and Paul Bacha. So Bacha was a politician. Sies had been a, um, uh, um, a, a bishop, indeed, the Bishop of Autun, a Catholic bishop. Famously, he was the author of um, Qu'est-ce que c'est le tiers état? What's a third estate? in which he said, what, what has the third estate been up till now? Nothing, but it aspires to be something. The third estate meant everybody who was not the nobility or the clergy. C.S. himself was, of course, first estate. He was clergy. But um, when the revolution came, he abandoned all that. Um, he'd gone into it out of sheer opportunism, C.S., and he didn't um, believe in that uh, one bit. Um, uh, and also, well, well, Napoleon was a close confidant of Charles Maurice, de Talleyrand Perigord, who was also a Catholic bishop and um, went into it because he had a, had a withered foot. For a nobleman, as, as, as Talleyrand was, as a boy, you'd either, be, you'd either be a soldier or a clergyman. As he was uh, lame, he couldn't be a soldier, therefore he went into the clergy, but made no attempt to, to, to observe vows of chastity. Anyway, but with the, the, these three men, they were ruling France, and Paul Bachard got bored of his mistress, Josephine, this youngish widow. So Napoleon was really smitten by her. She was six years older than him. She had two children already. Eventually they married. Goebbels type. Well, Goebbels was a propagandist, evil genius. So Josephine, or Joseph was her name actually. She was born in um, one of the French islands in the Caribbean. Her parents had a plantation. She was white. So they had the black people that were there were held in bondage there. So she had the most disgustingly racist views. And Napoleon was very influenced by that. Anti-black uh, prejudice was quite common in white countries at the time. So he married her, but she's unable to have more children. Um, he'd known her for some years, and she'd been unimpressed with them originally. Yeah, and Napoleon, he did have an affair with a Polish princess who's married to a Polish prince much, much older than her. Because um, remember, Poland had its own monarchy to the late 18th century, an elective monarchy. Anyone with the surname Ski, well, the suffix Ski to their surname, was allowed to vote. One third of the population was nobility there. So loads of Polish people say, oh, I'm a nobleman, but that means everybody just about. Um, okay. Now, one thing in, in, in Egypt, he'd um, thought, would he convert to Islam? Would he, would he, would he enter um, Egypt, on, no, sorry, not Egypt, would he enter India on, a, on an elephant? Would he wear a turban, write his own Quran, as he said, and have lots of dancing girls? Didn't happen. But he did bring a lot of savants with him, like scholars, to study ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, architecture, all sorts of things like that. And um, so um, Champoyon came with him. Champoyon, this chap who was... Uh, Converse in something like 28 languages. This uh, hyper polyglot, he famously 
crack the code of the Rosetta Stone, although actually various other scholars, different European nationalities, have made a lot of progress on the Rosetta Stone. It's a stone they found at Rosetta in Egypt, and it had things in um, uh, hieroglyphs in the more demotic sort of writing of ancient Egypt and in, and in ancient Greek, and, and uh, Champollion could read it in ancient Greek. Uh, anyway, he eventually was able to decipher this, this um, forgotten language, these hieroglyphs. Hieroglyph is in um, sacred carving, that's what it means in, in, in ancient Greek. Um, so that was one of the few lasting uh, positive legacies of, of Napoleon's time, the, the advance in Egyptology. So um, then um, Napoleon um, seized power in a putsch. Um, he'd, he'd raided the, what was it, the, the assembly, no, of the Council of the 500 or the Council of the Ancients, various, these various chambers of the legislature, and when he was almost stabbed to death and had to save his brother, Joseph, who was also in danger of his life, and that was that. So um, he decided to take the title consul, okay, like the ancient Romans had a consul, there'd be two consuls, then he'd become first consul, upgraded to first consul for life, that was that, and eventually he decided to be emperor. Um, so he declared himself to be emperor, like Charlemagne had um, 800 years, uh, sorry, sorry, 1,000 years prior to that, and he invited um, Pope Pius VIII, I forgot that, to his coronation at Notre Dame, um, and uh, he decided he would crown himself. People say, oh, he snatched the crown from the Pope's hands. No, it was already arranged that he would crown himself, as indeed Charlemagne had done. Charlemagne, as in Charles the Great, who was really the one who founded France as a united country, but France was much bigger than it is then, uh, back then than it is now on the Charlemagne, which is why there's a Charlemagne Prize for European unity. You know, it included what's now, but what's now the Netherlands, Belgium, a little bit of Spain, a little bit of Germany. Aachen was part of it, or Aix-la-Chapelle, as the French would call it. Um, anyway, so Napoleon, so far as I know, he's the one who actually pioneered the use of referenda. Referendum was an ask them, sons messed that up. Well, um, he didn't have any sons, he survived them too long. Um, so do you approve of the, these constitutional changes? Do you want there to be an emperor? And so he would cheat flagrantly on this and just assume, well, every soldier agrees with me, so I'll add another million votes to my yes vote and things like that. Um, anyway, so uh, that's how he effected these constitutional changes and claimed it was simply reflecting popular will. And that's why people, some people became very distrustful of, of referenda. Well, just because he cheated and they were not real results, there's no reason not to have proper referenda. Um, so um, he, he'd gone back to Catholicism and he'd kissed and made up with, with the Catholic Church, which is quite important. And even some former royalists took his side. So the Bonapartes, not the Bonapartes, so the Bourbons, the old French royal dynasty, were in exile in the United Kingdom. So some people were really Bonapartists, supported his dynasty. He gave himself other titles such as um, King of Italy, pro uh, protector of the Swiss Confederation and things like that. I can't remember what his one was in relation to Germany. Um, so... Uh, Mm. Yeah, because they did, they did invaded um, Switzerland as well. Switzerland could be un independent, but had to do what the French wanted to a considerable extent. He wanted to put his sisters and brothers on various thrones of Europe because he was intensely conscious he'd come from a bourgeois family and it was a time of great social uh, inegalitarianism. Oh, Charlemagne's sons messed things up. That's what LM is saying. Uh, so um, he made them king and queen of here and there, you know, had to marry into some established royal families made Bernadotte, one of his marshals, uh, king of Sweden. So yeah, Napoleon, um, he came out, he had about 20 marshals under him, mostly French, one was a hereditary Polish prince, and so on. Berthier was one of the famous ones, Marshal Ney, another. Mostly they'd come from aristocratic families, some had risen from the ranks. So Napoleon said every, every private carries a marshal's baton in his knapsack and has, has the opportunity to rise up the ranks. But really he mostly promoted those who were already um, well got. So his, his eldest brother, Joseph, became king of Spain, famously. But um, so he was master of, of Europe, really. Um, he, they fought the Battle of Austerlitz in December 1805, defeating um, the uh, Austrians and the, and the um, Russians. The Battle of Three Emperors, because the Emperor of uh, Austria is there, so was the Emperor of, um, uh, of uh, Russia. And afterwards, there's the Peace of Pressburg. Pressburg, we now call it Bratislava, in the capital of uh, Slovakia. So at the bishop's winter palace there, they signed that treaty, and that and that resulted in the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but uh, just shortly before the battle, well, um, he uh, had uh, received the news that the Battle of, of um, Trafalgar had been lost by the French and Spanish fleet, so he was not going to be able to invade the United Kingdom, which he really, really wanted. 
Uh, he realized that he couldn't take, he couldn't hold on to Louisiana. If the United States wanted to annex it, or even the British, something he could do, could do about it. That's why he sold Louisiana. Louisiana back then was much bigger than the modern state of Louisiana. It was a huge area of territory. If France had kept a hold of that, then history would have been very different. The United States wouldn't have expanded to the West, not nearly so much. France might have been much mightier. They just sort of remained at peace and made something of their huge American territory. Um, so, uh, yeah, he wanted to defeat the British. They'd gathered their ships at Boulogne, you know, these fairly flat-bottomed boats. Could they sail across the Atlantic and then go right out to the beach? But then, obviously, there was a storm or strong waves. They'd capsize. Didn't work. Were they able to dig a tunnel under the channel? He briefly uh, did a feasibility study into that. That wasn't happening either. Um, the British were a nation of shopkeepers whom he held in contempt. But he'd taken a lot of leave when he was a young army officer, even penned a novel, The Earl of Essex. Um, not about a historical Earl of Essex, the Earl of Essex in English tale, um, things like that. And uh, there was another romance that he wrote as well about some um, uh, swashbuckling uh, military buccaneer, as in it's meant to be semi-autobiographical, a bit like his fantasy. Well, yes, New Orleans in Louisiana, Nouvelle Orléans, uh, after the French city, on the Atlantic coast of France, from whence many people had embarked to the American continent. So how is he going to bring the British to their knees? Because remember, his brother was ruling, ruling Spain. They persuaded the um, feeble-minded king of Spain to abdicate. Uh, and a rebellion started in Spain, uh, Cinco de Mayo, and um, his brother, Joseph, uh, he wouldn't um, leave Madrid because he was so, so worried about assassination. All these guerrillas were fighting. And I can't remember, is it Goya did all those drawings of all the atrocities carried out? Guerrilla, the word was invented then as in little war. These partisans fighting in the Spanish mountains. Spain is very, very mountainous indeed. And eventually, Joseph wouldn't leave the palace. He was so worried about assassination and eventually had to flee. So the British, they landed in Portugal and Spain were helping. There's the Peninsula War. Sir John Moore came down there and uh, things went very badly for the French indeed. But his way to, to bring the British down was the continental system. He was gonna have um, sanctions. Nobody would trade with the British. And he said they live by their commerce and so their economy will collapse. We won't buy from them, we won't sell to them. So that was that because he controlled almost the whole of um, mainland Europe. Um, but uh, that's why we the graphite pencils, because the British used to use lead. They couldn't get lead, so they started reusing graphite for pencils. We still call them lead pencils, but they graphite for 200 years. Um, and this was Sir John Bellingham, the, the, um, uh, he's the guy who assassinated um, Spencer Percival, the prime minister, because of this not trading with Russia like criminal gangs. Now, Napoleon, he'd um, met the Emperor of Russia, the new impressionable Emperor Alexander I, after Emperor Paul died, and um, met him at Tilsit on a barge. And underneath the barge, I can't remember who was it, the young Emperor's, um, the young Emperor's advisor was hiding so we could whisper to him what to say. Of course, the Emperor of Russia spoke French. All, all European gentlemen spoke French. Um, and he made a very positive impression on the young Emperor who, uh, then said, okay, I'll join your side, and I'll join the continental system, no need to fight. Um, however, Russia soon started breaking this and trading with the United Kingdom anyway, and Napoleon said, mm, okay, well, I can't allow them to get away with this. If they start trading with the British, everyone will start, start doing commerce with the British, the whole continental system will collapse and we'll never win. So I've got to go to war, make an example of the Russians, we must penalize them for this, um, so invade Russia. So it was um, 1812, Midsummer's Day, They Cross the river into Russia, and the rest is history. Um, it's, it's well known by um, Lev Tolstoy's novels. Anyway, he got all the Battle of Borodino, um, a bit to the west of uh, Moscow. But Alexander Kutuzov said, no, let's just retreat um, and not defend Moscow, which actually wasn't the capital of St. Petersburg, it was the capital then. So he got to Moscow, and um, there was a sort of scorched earth policy by the Russians. He holed up in the Kremlin, should they stay for the winter or not? They're running low on prov provisions. He said, okay, actually, let's retreat from Moscow. Um, so they made that fateful decision, possibly a mistake. He wanted to blow up the Kremlin, but was not successful in that. Um, and then they were harassed all the way by Cossacks attacking them, their stragglers. Eventually, they run out of food, some of them dying of cold. Um, so that was that. Hundreds of thousands of men had invaded Russia, la grande armée. But a lot of the French army was not actually French. They're from many of the German states. Remember, Prussian was his side. There were people from Portugal, Spain, Italy, many, many European countries in his, in his polyglot army. 
but the officers all had to speak French to each other. So things were very, going very badly for Napoleon, and he was aware that there was, there was a rumor in Paris that he died, so he got, he got himself into a sleigh, pulled by fast horses, and hurried back to, to Paris to scotch his attempt to overthrow him. You know one of his sayings, um, uh, well, who, who was, wrote this about it? Was some French historian, or was it, was it, um, was it Talleyrand said, it was worse than a crime, it was a mistake about the execution of the Duke of Enghien. So the Duke of Enghien was a, was a royalist aristocrat who fled across the border into one of the German states early in Napoleon's reign. And he was causing trouble. Napoleon felt was, this guy was conspiring to start a royalist rebellion. So Napoleon had his men cross over into this German state, kidnap the Duke of Enghien, and bring him back to France. He was tried for high treason and executed by firing squad. But it was a breach of international law. It, sa it soured France's relations with other countries. So. Although he started out as a Republican, an extreme one as that, he'd ended up as a royalist with himself as king. Um, so he was, uh, didn't really have any ideology, didn't believe in anything very firmly, just his own, his own self-aggrandizement, but was physically courageous, unafraid of death. So the, the, the retreat from Moscow was the beginning of the end for him. He suffered, suffered such heavy casualties. The Prussians changed sides. Prussia was, at, was the largest state in Germany. Again, Germany was a very vague geographical expression at the time. There wasn't much of a German national identity. A lot of Germans spoke their dialect, didn't speak standard German. So Prussia is very roughly the area around Berlin. It's northeast Germany. So the largest state in Germany and thought to have the greatest military prowess. So then there was the Battle of Leipzig, commonly called the Battle of Nations, which was um, some way south of Prussia, which the French lost. They're very heavily outnumbered. One thing about Napoleon's tactics, well, he's an artillery officer, liked to have a grand battery of artillery in the middle, not spread it out. Um, and if possible, just have a numerical superiority. You might say, well, duh, of course you would. Sending forth a cavalry screen to see the enemy of light cavalry, fast moving cavalry, see the enemy's movements, confuse the enemy at, and, you know, attack any very small units. Um, and then he would mass troops as much as possible to have some overwhelming attack against some group of enemy, have as few of his soldiers hold off half the enemy as long as you could. And then he'd make a very forced, a very fast forced march to overwhelm the other group of the enemy. It's this sort of diamond shaped pattern he would have his, his, his soldiers in hollow squares sometimes, um, but, but speed was a decisive factor for him, which is why they didn't do very well for the supplies. He said they, the army would have to just have to live off the land. They would have to commandeer whatever they needed, food, boots and things like that, horses, um, but commandeering them, well, that came across as armed robbery to the people whose, whose land they passed through. So they were very unpopular in that sense. Um, anyway, so they retreat, retreat from Leipzig having to call up um, uh, underage boys and they need old men, Marie-Louise. I should have said one of the conditions of, of um, the, the Peace of Pressburg when he defeated um, the Austrian Empire was um, he was going to marry the emperor's daughter, uh, Marie-Louise, who was 18. And by this time, Napoleon was, let me think about, 42. Um, and uh, so she was again a sort of sacrificial virgin for him. And now he was married to um, Josephine, that one small problem. And again, she was incapable of having more children. Napoleon had, a, had at least one child with a mistress by this stage, so he's aware that he certainly was fertile. So um, he, he was quite a womanizer. But um, anyway, um, what was he going to do about this marriage? So he got the Pope to issue an annulment. I don't know what pretext there was for that, but obviously it was complete hypocritical, hypocritical nonsense. The church was corrupt as hell. If you're wealthy and well-connected, you will get an annulment saying your marriage didn't count as though it never happened. There was some impediment to your marriage in the first place. Now, the proper grounds for an annulment is you found out you were actually long lost sister and brother, or one of you was mentally ill at the time of the marriage, or one of you was underage, or you only did it under duress, or one of you didn't want to have children, something like that. It's nothing to do with behavior, it's not because of adultery, cruelty, abandonment, um, or just, um, you know, incompatibility. Annulment means the marriage didn't count. I find it fascinating that many European flags originated from Napoleonic times. Well, the French invented that tricolor, partly to do with the colors of Paris. Then the Dutch got it at this time, but they put it, instead of putting it um, uh, this way, vertically, they did it horizontally and so on. So, so many flag flags are tricolors like that. And uh, the, the French, first of all, hadn't sorted out whether they were going to do it horizontally or vertically, or if it was, you know, which side was blue, which side was red, and all the rest of it. They'd had the fleur de lis beforehand, those golden lily flowers on that uh, midnight blue background, or sometimes a white background with um, sort of Cambridge blue uh, lily flowers. Um, anyway, so uh, 
well, I can't really think what else to say. He was becoming predictable in his moves. Okay, very bold maneuvers, overwhelming attacks, timing was crucial. Um, and the Battle of Borodino in Russia had been quite ill. This had affected his performance. He was beginning to get piles and he was, he was disbelieving and scathing of any intelligence reports, seeming to refuse to release reserves, almost wanting his soldiers to suffer because he was suffering. And, and um, he wasn't risk averse and attacking some very well defended positions in Borodino, even though almost impossible to take. So Borodino was kind of inconclusive, but the Russians did retreat after that. As part of their whole strategy, Kutuzov's strategy was not to offer battle, to simply retreat and exhaust the French that way, allow them to to run out of supplies and die in winter, and then they'd win. And it, and it worked for the, for the Russians, actually. They didn't suffer a profit of feet. Grown bored. You've grown bored, have you? Um, so um, 1814, they, that's when they, they lost um, Leipzig and way back in, in France, some last through desperate battles. There weren't enough, wasn't enough soldiers. The Allies, the, the French, the Dutch, the Prussians, the Russians, the Austrians, the Spanish, they're all closing in on France. You should, you should see this series sharp about that fictional British officer, Sharp. So finally at Fontainebleau, he's, he's prepared, he was, uh, he was willing to abdicate. So he spoke to the old guard for the last time. He set up the Imperial Guard, the old guard, the middle guard, the young guard, according to age. Some of his, his, his elite soldiers, these crack soldiers are older veterans, usually grew moustaches, Napoleon, and they had higher wages. They used to share beds as well, not because they're gay, but partly for warmth. So an elite force, but was that a mistake? They would have made excellent non-commissioned officers. This is the problem with some sort of, sort of cream unit, is then you take away some of the best men who otherwise be excellent NCOs if you spread them out. But um, anyway, he said goodbye to them, some were apparently crying, and whispered to Marshal Ney, I shall be home before the violets bloom again, which is why it's known as Papa Violette. So he went into exile in, in um, uh, on Elba, this Italian island. I've never been there, quite like to go what was that palindromic sentence? Abel was I, I saw Elba. Um, he's allowed to take a thousand soldiers with him and actually rule the island. So there he was. So they restored the Bourbon dynasty in France. So Louis XVIII came back as a young, younger brother of Louis XVI. Yes, both using the name Louis, one of the many forenames, this incredibly obese Louis, um, who was said to look like a pear. You should see that 1970 film, Waterloo. And he's played by Orson Welles, who by that stage was morbidly obese. Um, uh, anyway, what's, what's the next thing? So he's there for um, ooh, not quite, about a year in Elba, and then he heard rumors that the, um, the Allies uh, were considering exiling somewhere further away, possibly St. Helena, and uh, he decided he needed to act, and he thought the Allies will soon start squabbling about what to do. France had made these territorial gains um, under him, was France allowed to keep this land or not? Even though the, even those who turned against Napoleon would quite like to keep the land they'd conquered at such a high price. Um, and, um, but uh, the uh, coalition wouldn't want them to. Anyway, so in the middle of the night, he slipped away with one ship, sailed to mainland France, and uh, landed at Golf Juan, very close to Cannes. I was in the town, actually. And they show you exact jetty where he landed, and he was gonna march to Paris. He, he took only a handful of soldiers with him. Uh, so that was that. So the news reached um, Louis XVIII that uh, Napoleon had landed. He sent Marshal Ney, arrest him. Um, and Marshal Ney said, I will return him to you in a cage. He certainly reneged on his promise. And when the news reached the various courts of Europe that Napoleon had escaped, there was consternation. What were they going to do? Remember, there had been uh, 20 years of warfare because of the French Revolution. Over a million Frenchmen had been killed. A million more had settled outside France. Many people had been wounded. The country had been wrecked. Just taxation after taxation, the blood tax, conscription was very unpopular. So there'd been enormous upheaval in other countries as well. People had their horses taken from their farms for the army. So many buildings had been burnt down. But anyway, so Napoleon approached the city of Grenoble and he, the, 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 the people tore down the wooden gates of the city and laid them on the road to welcome him in. I have a friend who I once discussed about with about Napoleon. He said that in some ways his empire was like a second Reich and a German empire. Well, a lot of it was based on Germany, and a lot of his troops were German, but there wasn't much of a German national identity at the time. The Polo did help to, help to create it, because by the end, all the German states were against him, and there was um, the first Freikorps fighting against him at this stage, or the Russians call it the, the uh, Patriotic War, as in the Great Patriotic War was the Second World War for them. Uh, if it weren't for Napoleon, there'd be no United Germany wake-up call. Well, that's very dubious. Many of the modern liberal era values started the French Revolution, but quickly turned to tyranny. Um, well, some of them did start then, yes, um, or, or the, the American Revolution indeed, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Rights of Citizen. 
should we have a fair trial? I think we should. Is torture bad? I'd say, well, say that it is. Um, should we have freedom of expression? I think so. Should there be separation of church and state? I think so. Some, no more divine right of kings, no more serfdom, having to work, do some unpaid labor a couple of days a week, having to do unpaid road works, having to be here a peasant on this farm. You can't go away and do another job. You must stay here and pay rent and only mill through their mill, pay the over the odds for that and seek permission of your landlord to, to marry or take holy orders. And the landlord then may claim le, le droit de seigneur as in, as in his right to deflower the bride and blah, blah, blah. Know that largely fallen into abeyance by this time. But see, which is that opera? Is it um, the Barber of Seville or the other one the, the, about this, about um, Prima Nocta? Anyway, so, um, uh, so Marshal Ney went over to him. At one, one point, Napoleon was confronted by some soldiers and opened his coat and said, all oh, right, shoot me then, I'll make it easier for you. You can see where my heart is. But they cheered and joined his side, as did Marshal Ney. So Louis XVIII realized most of his soldiers had abandoned him, so he fled to the United Kingdom as well. So um, one thing that all these um, established governments of Europe could agree on, Napoleon is not being allowed back. They could have negotiated, but nah. -uh. So the French, the Dutch, the British, the many German states, particularly Prussia, Austria, Russia, Spain, they all said, we're gonna send troops to crush him. We're not gonna allow him to rise to power again because he will cause bloody havoc all across Europe. So Napoleon reached Paris, but he got a subdued reception. A lot of people were not happy to see him. They knew this belt war. He had led them to disaster. Some of them were Bourbonists anyway. Uh, and others of them said, you know, you had your chance, you screwed up. You didn't know when to stop. In terms of power and how much of Europe was under his control, like Charlemagne before him. Well, Napoleon even more. I mean, he got to Moscow, for goodness sake. I know he lost it. But at one point, he controlled all the way from Spain to Russia. Um, uh, okay, so... Um, one of, the, one of the edicts he found time to issue when he got to Paris was to reintroduce slavery. One of the reasons he'd lost is they'd been fighting in Haiti. Haiti, this French-ruled island of the Caribbean. Most people were black. These people had been abducted in Africa, taken across the ocean to the Antilles and forced to toil in the most hellish conditions. And they, they'd, they'd rebelled against it. Toussaint Louverture had led a rebellion against it, although he ended his life as a prisoner in France. But anyway, Napoleon said, oh, we must crush them, we must keep that, and was sending soldiers over to Haiti. Many of his soldiers died, mostly, mostly of yellow fever, but the Haitians won their liberty. Slavery was, was independent. It was the first black majority country to, to win its independence against whites in history. Um, if, he, if he hadn't treated them abominably, this wouldn't have happened. So he was trying to bring back slavery and he was trying to reconquer Haiti and force the black people back into servitude. He didn't actually dispatch an army in, in 1815. At that stage, he needed every man he could in France. This is part of his 100 days. His comeback from when he landed in mainland France to when he was finally captured was roughly 100 days. So anyway, gathering an army, he found it difficult to get recruits, conscripted some people, and he marched north. The British landed in what was in the Netherlands. Belgium didn't exist. It was not part of the Netherlands. Yes, look at Haiti now. I know it's in the part of state. That doesn't mean that slavery is good. I know it's often been ill served by governments ever since. It's lacking in natural resources. But yeah, it, it, could, it could do a lot better. The poorest country uh, in the American continent. So um, the British had landed there to team up with the Dutch army and some of the German minor states were sending their troops there. Hanover, remember George III was king of Hanover as well as king of the United Kingdom. So um, Napoleon's idea was let's defeat them fast before the, um, uh, the Russians and others come and the Austrians come and they, they have such a huge army that outnumber me so, so much I'll never ever defeat them. So defeat his enemies piecemeal, that was the idea. So he struck north into what's now Belgium and the rest is history. Minor battles, Ligny, Quatre Bras, um, and then the Germans under Blücher were, were advancing. So um, the Duke of Wellington, he was the British commander. He had some uh, some Dutch troops under his command and troops from the minor German states. He had the King's German Legion, i.e. from Hanover, and they fought there. So uh, about 10 miles south of uh, Brussels, um, uh, the Duke of Wellington, he uh, had his troops in battle array, spread them out, but not too much fairly spread out, very difficult to outflank, but not so spread out that units could be isolated and defeated in detail. So if, if Napoleon did want to launch a flanking maneuver, he'd have to go a very long way around, it would be very slow, and the Allies would have time to take evasive action, to send reinforcements, to change their positions, things like that. So um, it was the 18th of June, 1815, so there would be very heavy rain the night before. 
And remember, Napoleon had put huge faith in artillery. This is the thing, he wanted speed, but he wanted artillery. I mean, you could have one, you could have other. If you left the artillery behind, you go a lot faster, you'd have more horses for the cavalry and so on. But he had waited a few hours for the, for the ground to dry out. It'd been unseasonable rain the night before. And this, this crucial loss of time may have cost him the battle. Finally, the, the ground was sufficiently dry to move the cannon forward, have his grand battery in the middle and begin. Now, um, uh, Napoleon, well, his tactics had been studied by the Duke of Wellington, who'd learnt how to defeat him. Napoleon had become predictable. Um, anyway, so Blücher, the, the uh, Prussian commander, was some miles away to the east fighting a minor French detachment. When was Blücher going to arrive? The Duke of Wellington had a small numerical advantage at this stage. He was on the hill, and that was that. His aim was to defend this hill. If you want to get to Brussels, Napoleon, you've got to drive me off this hill. And Napoleon's aim was obviously to do that. Then there was this, this farm, La Haye Sainte, um, as in the Holy Hedge, a bit further forward of the main British position, and Le Hugemont. And so um, Napoleon tried very hard to storm these, these um, farms, but didn't succeed. So Marshal Ney was there, d'Erlon was one of his commanders as well. But anyway, um, uh, so the, so the British had formed squares against the French cavalry, and the French charged and charged. Now, horses aren't stupid, they won't jump onto, onto like a forest of bayonets. Just, you know, these, these, these muskets took about 20 seconds to load at the time. So that's why you have a few men lined up, one of them fire, and then he's reloading, and someone else fire, and then he's reloading, and the third guy fire, by which time the front guy's musket might be ready to fire again. But when all their, all their, their bayonets are pointing at you in all different angles, the horses are not going to jump on that because they're going to die. So the thing is, what you do is you, you, you bring your cavalry up, you get the, you get the enemy to put his, 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 his infantry into squares, and then you bring the artillery up, and then they're a sit and duck. It's such a big target, so densely packed, you can't miss. Sounds like Andrew Jackson's Battle of New Orleans in the mud. Yeah, well, the War of 1812 overlapped with this, where the, uh, the United States was fighting against the um, British. Napoleon was hoping he'd bring the, the Americans in on his side. I won't talk about the, the, the um, uh, War of 1812 at the same time. It'd get, it'd get a bit too confusing. Um, anyway, so the French cavalry took ter terrible casualties. There were various French attempts to attack up the hill, but uh, didn't get very far. Um, and then there was some... Uh, finally, the old guard made an attack and there were far more British troops than they'd realized, hiding in the long grass, and many, many volleys fired into the, into the Imperial Guard. Remember, and this was his, the creme de la creme of the French army, and they broke and ran, and there was obviously panic in the French army, and people couldn't believe it, that they wouldn't do, do so. They did rally later on, and someone said, the old guard dies, but not, does not surrender. And so many of them did die, rather than flee for their lives, when they'd finally made a stand. But it, um, then they saw some dark uniforms on the, on the eastern horizon, and it was getting towards evening, towards sunset, even of a mid-June day, almost midsummer's day. That dark color, was that the Prussian black or was that the French navy blue? Who was arriving? If French reinforcements were, alive, were arriving, Napoleon could still win, outflank the Allies. If the Prussians were arriving, then that means that the Allies would have almost a two-to-one advantage, and it was curtains for Napoleon, because the French had suffered higher casualties. They were not making progress against the, um, against the Allies. They were not driving them off the hill. And as it came a bit closer, it was obvious that it was the Prussian black, and Napoleon realized he'd met his Waterloo, as the expression was. So he got into his horse-drawn carriage and said, let's go to Paris, abandoning his men. Um, some, of, some of whom fled, some of whom surrendered. Um, the Duke of Wellington said it was a damn close run thing. I think he doesn't give himself enough credit. So the Duke of Wellington, he had never had anything but the uttermost respect and admiration for his, for his adversary, Napoleon, saying his presence on the battlefield is worth 40,000 men. Certainly put heart into the French troops. Some of them had really believed, believed in him. So Blücher, the, um, the, the Prussian commander, was, was arriving, and that's why Prince Blücher was a popular name for um, a pub in the United Kingdom. Well even to this day. And the, the uh, Prussians band played Nun dankend a la God. Now thank we all God, as in they've been blessed with victory. So Napoleon had carried this um, vial around his neck full of poison. He decided that's it, time to commit suicide, swallowed it. But in all the years that had been there, the, the, it had degraded and it didn't kill him. So he got back to Paris, what was he gonna do? He eventually surrendered to the Allies. Um, and so they quickly took him to a ship, HMS Bellerophon, and he was sailed off um, into exile. And on the deck, he looked at France for the last time receding over the horizon. 
He was astonished by the discipline of the Royal Navy. He'd seen it being on French warships and he couldn't hear himself think. The sailors would walk around without any shirts on, they'd be um, uh, eating with their hands on deck, and they were very disorderly, slovenly and slatternly by comparison. The ship anchored off the coast of the United Kingdom, and the word got around that uh, Napoleon was aboard, and it was someone like Cornwall or Devon. Little people came out in their rowing boats to have a look at him in his cabin. So he was treated with um, great consideration. Anyway, they sailed off to St. Helen, and he was exiled there. Hundreds of British soldiers were there, to, to guard him. So he lived in considerable comfort, given his own house and servants. And uh, he wrote his memoirs there. He befriended a little girl. They used to play together. And he tended his garden. And he lived a kind of quite humble life. Now, Marie-Louise, his wife, had given birth to his son. Um, she didn't want to join him. His son was given the title Duke of Reichstadt, but uh, he died at the age of 21. Um, and his son, uh, sorry, his, his wife, Marie-Louise, she'd never loved him, never wanted to marry her family's enemy. And then she moved off to Parma, ruled Parma in Italy, and took um, a, um, a lover and had some children with him. It was blatantly outside of wedlock. So quite humiliating for Napoleon to hear this by that stage. There was also this um, misunderstanding that he was short. He was not particularly short. He was about five foot five in French feet and inches. A French inch is bigger than a British inch. So by our height, he was something like five foot seven. So for the time, maybe bang on average. Um, so when they, because this is called the little corporal, little just being affectionate. And as I say, he was ne neither little nor a corporal. And so he didn't have small man syndrome, despite people talking about, despite people talking about Napoleon complex. So there was no way he was going to be able to, to, to escape from there. And that was that the Allies didn't want him to come back. He t had tall guards he picked. Well, a lot of people did as one of the um, Prussian kings was Frederick the Great had those, um, those, those Potsdam giants, those men selected for their extraordinary height and even choosing very lanky women for them to marry, a sort of selective breeding program. Um, so uh, what else? Anyway, uh, then he died in 1822. His, his uh, first love, Josephine, whom he always loved, had died uh, the year before. She was back in France, rather miffed that their marriage had been annulled. Um, and um, so he wrote these self-justificatory memoirs saying it'll show that I never, it'll be shown that I never started a war, they always attacked me and so on, um, which was uh, mostly drivel. And if he had been more sensible and he hadn't started wars, had settled, had been satiated earlier, he might have survived as emperor ruling so much of the world. Um, so, you know, he, he, he thought that the, the key to all this was defeating the United Kingdom. He said, give me the Straits of Dover for six hours and I shall give you the world because if he could control the Straits of Dover, if he could sail an army across and land in the United Kingdom, he was sure to win. Was this army better man for man than the British army? Good question. The British army were mostly volunteers, it was just their higher caliber, they wanted to be soldiers. Um, he had better tactics. They defeated the British army quite a lot in the early days. Um, I'm not sure their technology was about the same. The Royal Navy was certainly better. Um, I'm not being chauvinistic, it just is objective if you see the military record. There were some French naval victories, and the United Kingdom, a lot of people overlooked that, but there were obviously more British ones. Um, so better than many armies, people say he was a military genius, but he usually had numerical advantage, so perhaps it wasn't that extraordinary. Um, anything else about him? So yeah, he died um, there in 1822. He died of stomach cancer, same thing that killed his father. There was quite a high, uh, high concentration of arsenic in his hair. They'd wallpapered his ceiling. There was some sort of arsenic in the glue, bring that in over a sustained period. Is that what killed him? Possibly it was a slow motion assassination. They could have engineered a more obvious assassination. But uh, they don't seem to have, have considered putting him on trial for all these crimes. You know, you're not a real emperor. That was treason, overthrowing the king, and you started all these wars of aggression. Doesn't seem to have crossed anybody's mind. Would that have made him a martyr? Perhaps. So then um, uh, his, his natural son still lived on. I bet the poison didn't help, indeed. Um, his very last word was Josephine, the name of his, of his true love. Um, so years later, his body was repatriated to France around about 1850 and buried at Les Invalides. And um, his, his natural son marched in that funeral procession. Um, he'd been ambassador to the United Kingdom, his son by one of his mistresses. Um, what else? So, yeah, he come up with um, Le Code Napoléon, as in their Napoleonic Code, their, their legal code. And he, he was a very learned man, and experts in various fields were often impressed by how much he knew at, about this topic or that. Um, um, so it's a bit like Justinian and in roughly the same order. He didn't do all himself. He had some various jurists to help him. Um, and he first of all said that there is no uh, retroactivity. No law in this can be used to punish somebody 
uh, if you're breaking a law which wasn't uh, a law before this came in. And one thing is, is he scrapped the law against homosexuality. Was it simply an oversight? I'm not sure. Possibly because one of his brothers, Louis, was homosexual. Louis, who made King of Holland, and Louis went up to the Netherlands, attempted to learn Dutch and address the Dutch Parliament and mispronounce things. His brother Louis famously told the Dutch Parliament, I am the rabbit of Holland, when he wished to say, I am the king of Holland. But Koning, he mispronounced Koningchen. Okay, he's trying to say king, but pronounce it as rabbit. In Dutch, the words are quite similar. Um, so um, that Louis, his, his brother's wife, had three sons, only the youngest of them survived. And Louis was gay, um, so he thought his wife had a paramour. So um, Louis's son was almost certainly not his actual son, was his wife's son by her lover. And anyway, so we know Napoleon died, had no legitimate son. His elder brother Joseph had only daughters. And then um, Louis's son was known as Louis Napoleon, or Louis, Louis's putative son. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, a very short man, and he um, wrote the principles of Bona Bonapartism. Well, Napoleon Bonaparte was totally totally unprincipled. So Napoleon Bonaparte, then known to Bonapartists as Napoleon I, and then there's um, going to be Napoleon the, 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 the II, um, uh, which would be, I suppose, his brother Joseph, who survived him, his elder brother, even though Napoleon was not part of his name. And Napoleon III is, is Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and he, I won't tell you the whole story, he made it a comeback, 1848, got himself elected president of France, 1851, seized power, made himself emperor, defeated the Battle of Sedan, 1870, abdicated, went into exile, and died in the United Kingdom. His son, known as Prince Imperial, was attached to the British Army in the Zulu War, killed in 1879. That was really the end of the dynasty. There are collateral descendants of Napoleon, and some of them married into the other French royal families because of the Bourbons, the ones who were overthrown, overthrown in, in 1792, came back in, in um, 1814, overthrown, came back, blah, blah, finally overthrown in 1830. But they're, they're, they're Bourbons even today. Um, and then there's the Egalité dynasty, who ruled from 1830 to 1848. But people from the three dynasties have married each other. Who would be the king of France if they had? Well, which dynasty do you want to go for? So legitimists are the people who support the Bourbon dynasty, the people who were there before the French Revolution. If you think that's confusing, well, you're right. So um, Napoleon, he renumbered houses say odd, odd, odd numbers on this side, even numbers on that side, a logical thing to do. Anything else he did that was particularly good? Not really well, he said, they, we got, they got to build Paris anew. Didn't get very far with it. L'Arc de Triomphe um, only started under him. His um, nephew, um, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, or Napoleon III, he did a lot more with, with Haussmann. So some people confuse the, the uncle, Napoleon the Great, and Napoleon III. The French need an emperor. Well, some people say that the French have this weakness for, for um, Caesar figures, um, and those Césarisme populaire is what brought back Napoleon III. That's why the Allies in the Second World War were very iffy about de Gaulle, thinking um, he, might be, uh, he might be this military strongman. The French are too attracted to di dictators. Now, um, Nicolas Sarkozy is said to have had quite a soft spot for Napoleon Bonaparte. Other people see Bonaparte as a proto-fascist, he was a military dictator. Seem some countries need a Caesar, and their system is quite authoritarian. Quite a lot of power resides in the hands of the, of the president. So um, he didn't annex Andorra. Macron seems to think so, does he? Tsar, someone's writing, etc. Um, so, because remember, the, the head of French head of state is the co prince of Andorra, along with the bishop of Urgell. Andorra is a tiny mountainous country which nestles in the Pyrenees in between France and Spain, and nobody's ever bothered conquering it for centuries. It's not even part of the European Union. So I can't think of anything else he did which really lasted. I mean, obviously, the Louisiana Purchase had a major effect on history. That wasn't a gain for France. Um, so people say Napoleonic to mean, I suppose, overweening, overambitious, um, conceited, something like that. So um, uh, there were a few positive legacies for him. But um, he said to, to, to die is to, is to die once, but to live defeated is to die every day. Well, he, he died every day, therefore. So when the Duke of Wellington defeated him, he had very sees various things from him, um, like um, uh, is, it, is it his horse's hoof was used as, a, um, uh, as a, uh, an ashtray or something like that. I can't remember the name of, of um, Napoleon's favorite horse. 
um, Egypt campaign comments on China. Well, oh yeah, well, good point. Napoleon said, when China wakes, the world will tremble. And I suppose it's happened because he said China is so gigantic, it will be so mighty. It was a sleeping giant in the 18th century, early 19th century, hadn't advanced technologically for a long time because um, it become complacent, a bit like the United States is now, this superiority complex, assuming we've got absolutely nothing to learn from other countries, we are just the best in every way, which is a very foolish thing to think. You could always learn from other countries. How are they advancing technologically, scientifically? Is their political system best? Don't start with the presumption that your country is necessarily the wisest or does things in the best possible way. So the Chinese finally get their act together. Um, it's a huge area, a huge population, and uh, could exert a great deal of power, and indeed it's happened. So um, that is that. Um, Napoleon, I can't think of any other things. Well, go to Apsley House in London, also known as Number One London, that's the Duke of Wellington's house, and you'll see various items of war booty, Napoleon, art, Napoleon artifacts carried off, the National Army Museum in the United Kingdom. You'll see things, things belonging to him. So he was reburied in Les Invalides in, in France, which was, um, Really, it was a place to care for old soldiers um, in, in Paris. You know, the Royal Hospital Chelsea, as in its a soldier's retirement home, is based on the idea of Les Invalides. Les Invalides dates right back to the mid 17th century, but it's got Napoleon's huge, glorious tomb and all sorts of inscriptions around it and uh, battle scenes. Napoleon wanted to build a channel tunnel. Yes, I mentioned that earlier on, but it just, just was not feasible with the technology available at the time. Even in more recent times, it took them like six years to build. Uh, and obviously in the in the 18th century, with the technology they had then, um, it would have taken decades to build. So it just wasn't going to happen. Could they even use hot air balloons to go over the channel? They looked into that one. But you really had no way of steering at the mercy of the winds. And then trying to land, where were you, where were you going to land? They might be very widely separated. This before rodeos or anything like that. He seemed to... Um, sort of foreshadow railways saying, wouldn't be a great way if we could tie wagons together and make them all go really fast. They already had the steam engine by this time, very, very few steam, steam engines. I don't know if France had them, pulling very heavy weights along roads. They also had um, horse-drawn carriages on rails. It's only later George Stevenson had the idea of putting them together. We'll take the steam engine and we'll take the rails and we'll put them together. And that's the train, 1825. Or there is a Frenchman who hit on roughly the same idea about the same time. So the French could also claim the railway and the train. So that is the end of um, Napoleon Bonaparte, um, a warmonger, I suppose. Um, obviously not someone to thank. There's so many um, hundreds of thousands of completely innocent men of all sorts of nationalities who got killed because of him. People had their houses raided, their food taken, their horses taken, their houses burnt down. A lot of civilians killed. I know a lot of military commanders lead to this kind of thing, but in his case, they really were wars of aggression, imposing sort of a Carthaginian peace. Um, uh, looting lots of um, art treasures of various countries. I know he's not the first one to do it, and imposing these indemnities, these ruinous reparation payments on various countries. Um, uh, but it wasn't trying to do it to help people. He had nothing really to bring to them, just put his, king, his sisters and brothers on the throne. Seemed to have an inferiority complex about coming from a middle-class family, writing to the Tsar of Russia, dear brother emperor, who'd write back, dear general Bonaparte, who wouldn't accept him as an emperor, and that really got to him. I think that was his psychological flaw, not his stature. Okay, that's enough about Napoleon. I'm signing off now. Please support me on Patreon. Uh, you know, look me up on, on Facebook, George from Ireland, see my articles there. I'm on Twitter and on Instagram. Goodbye.